Hello and welcome back to It's Another Watch. So, in this one, it's... This one's a bit of an up and down one. This was my first ever mod. Uh, I watched uh, just one more watch's video on the SNZ H57 and I said, I have to get one of those, look at it. And then I subsequently butchered it. Basically, I wanted to make it look like a planet ocean. So I thought I'll just change it to Speedmaster arrow tipped hands and then change the bezel insert, right? But when I looked, I obviously this was my first ever mod. I knew nothing about watch parts or Seiko parts. And so I didn't realize that you could take bezel inserts for other watches and as long as they were roughly the same dimensions, make them work. Or, you know, get a Dremel and sand it down so that it fits wherever you want it to fit. So I just started looking for compatible SNZH bezel inserts. And the only Planet Ocean Star one I could find was the Namaki Mods blue ceramic one. So suddenly a hand and insert swap became a dial swap. I needed a blue dial to go with the blue bezel insert. So I got myself a SNZH53 dial. So now we've changed the dial, the hands and the bezel. But then I found out that it had mineral crystal instead of sapphire crystal. And I thought, well, you, you've got to get sapphire, right? So I swapped the crystal. We had sapphire crystal there. And then I realized how convenient it was to have hacking and hand winding of the NH36. And so then it became a dial hand movement insert crystal swap. And that was all fine. I had a beautiful watch out of it. I mean, look at this, this, this is a, a, a like a blue planet ocean, it, it's great. But the paint on the bezel insert for the numbers started to go pink. So I got my money back from the Mocky Mods for it and it's forever sitting in a bag never to be used. But I was back to the drawing board so I thought let's get a let's get a planet ocean bezel insert in there, a regular one and we'll sand it down with a diamond dremel bit. So I did that. I put a black dial back on it which meant buying another one because I had I'd ruined the black dial because this was my first mod and I had no idea what I was doing. So I got another black dial and this is what I got. But it wasn't I don't know, something about it didn't quite look right, so I tried a bezel insert from one second closer, which albeit looks nice, but it again it didn't look it didn't quite look right and there were gaps inside the seams of the bezel so we were back to the drawing board at this point i decided you know what the original insert isn't so bad let's just put that back on there leave the speedmaster hands on there and it's sort of a snzh 55 with a sort of upgraded omega-esque look and that was all fine until the minute hand became loose enough that when you shake the watch it just just flies around in there which is just it's not what you want so i thought all right let's let's completely reset the slate on this let's let's do something else originally i had tried to avoid the 55 fathoms mod i'd seen it everywhere that's what people were always doing with the snzh and i didn't want to do that but i thought you know what fine let's do that and that's what this video is today we're going to take my absolutely battered SNZH 55K1 and we're going to attempt to turn it into a 55 fathoms and spoiler alert I do make some mistakes so let's get the parts on the table and have a look at them so these are the parts to start with we've got the SNZH 55K1 case with a piece of double dome sapphire crystal that I put in there when I modded it last year then of course everything else is stock the bezel insert the bracelet the case back then here I've got the NH36 that I put in this build previously, that I transferred the black calendar discs over from the 7S36C, but I didn't transfer the movement ring over, so I'm going to take this grey one off and swap it with the black one from the 7S36, so it does mean I'm going to have to take these plates off again. And what's nice about the NH36 is you can just take the C-clip and the day disc off and use it like an NH35. And this of course is the aforementioned black movement ring from the 7S36C. It's important that we couple this with the original case bag so that there's no gap between the dial and what would be the chapter ring. Now, speaking of the dial, this is the Yaboki's 55 Fathoms modern style dial. 
with that wonderful black sunburst texture. That is beautiful. And I chose the C1 loom in the hopes that it will appear white in natural light and glow green in the dark. And then of course finally we have the modern 55 Fathoms hands, also from Yabokis, with C1 loom to match. So there are the parts. Let's get stuck in. The grey movement spacer in the NH36 is thinner than the black one from the 7S36, which means when the case back pushes up against the bottom of it, it doesn't push up far enough, which makes a gap between the chapter ring and the dial. You can get different case backs that have more of a lip underneath that will press up against the grey spacer and remove the gap, or you can just swap the movement ring like I'm doing here. Now that I've got those screws off, I can remove these metal plates and the calendar disc, and then we can take it out of the movement holder. Then using a screwdriver, I'm just going to find any gaps that I can use to gently pry it up. And then once I've created a seam, I'm just going to run the screwdriver along the seam to continue to lift it up around the edges. That way I don't have to flip this thing upside down and risk any of those little cogs and gears coming out. Once it's come up all the way around, we can just lift that off and put it to one side. Then we can get the black spacer from the 7S36C and line it up with the holes that the dial feet would go through and then just gently press it down into place until you hear the plastic snap round the movement. Then we can pop it back in the movement holder, ready to set all the components of the date disc back on there, starting with a little metal plate. Just making sure that the two pins stick up through the holes there to keep it aligned. Then I like to lift the date disc into place with a piece of Rotico and then hold down the plate with the toothpick as not to scratch it and then apply a little bit of pressure with my fingers and rotate it until that date disc snaps into place. Then starting with this screw for the top plate, I'm just going to put two screws in to make sure that that gear goes down so that it functions correctly because I've had issues before where the gears sort of get stuck on each other. So just to make sure that it's functioning correctly like that. As you can see, it doesn't do anything when I turn it this way because there's no day disc, but when I turn it backwards, the date is functioning just fine. Now that we know that works, I can put the last two screws in and tighten all of them down. I like to test it one more time once I've tightened down all the screws just to make sure that I haven't screwed anything up. Then we'll just give the date disc a little clean with some Rotico and we won't be needing a day disc or C-clip on there so we can go straight to the dial. So this one's got dial feet for both 3 and 4 o'clock crown positions, so I'm going to lay the grey movement spacer down where the crown would be at the 3 o'clock position to determine which feet I need and which ones I don't, and then I can take the ones I don't need off with the flush cutters. And we'll just do a quick test fit to make sure that I have determined the correct feet to use and that it's still functioning, which it is, and then we can sand down those little remainders of the removed dial feet and clean it up with a piece of Rotico. Now we can put the dial back on and it should sit much more flush now that I've filed those down. Then we can get any particles off the dial with a piece of Rotico. And I did give the silicon mat a clean before I laid the dial face down on it anyway, so that minimizes any dirt that will get on the dial. Then I'm just setting the time so that the date ticks over and then we're ready to put the hands on. So I'm just getting it into position and then making sure that it's aligned by giving it a little nudge. And then we can press it down. And this is where everything went horribly wrong. I put too much pressure on the hour hand, causing it to sit right on the dial. This actually happened with the previous dial on this watch, and no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't get the hand off without scratching and ruining the dial. So I thought maybe I can get away with it. It's not interfering with any of the indices. It should be fine, right? No, it wasn't. More on that in a minute. But I was able to get it off, miraculously, so we can try again. Although that is still sitting close to the dial, there's much more of a gap underneath this time, so at least it won't scrape the dial anymore. At this point, there's no other way to describe it, I'm just pissed off because the chances of a nice clean build have just gone straight out the window. But what are you going to do? You've got to keep going, so I'm making my best efforts here to align the minute hand before pressing it down and checking that there's no interference, which there isn't. So then we can give the hands a little dab with some Rotico and then move on to the second hand. I like to hold it in place with some Rotico and give it a gentle push onto the pin just to make sure it's sitting on there and then I can pull the Rotico away and then firmly press it down so that it's good and properly on there. 
It's moments like these that make me genuinely detest putting hands on a watch because of the massive potential failure. Look at the scrape on this dial here. Let me show it to you. Look at that. You see there's like a ring going around here. I mean, I know on camera it just looked like there's a mark here and one on the other side, but it is literally a ring that goes all the way around. I'm just absolutely devastated. Every time I build a watch these days, I'm making a mistake. Mistakes that I didn't make in the previous build. Each one has a different mistake. Ah. And with this particular build at this point, I actually just don't care anymore. I'm, I'm just disappointed with my failure here. I almost don't want to finish it, but I will. I just... I just should have take, tried to take the hand off. I shouldn't have left it where it was. But last time a hand was down that far, I couldn't get it off and I didn't want to wreck the dial, but I wrecked it anyway. Gosh, how not to make a watch, am I right? Still, I think it's important to share both failures and successes so that we can learn something, even if it's that I'm an idiot. <laughs> and if you're someone who thinks of the glass as half full, then you'd be thinking, come on, it could be worse. It gets worse, just wait. Just before I was going to case it up here, I gave it a dab with IPA after the fluid from the air can came out all over the dial, and I realized that the dial paint was so thin it was coming off! I, 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 ah. Can you use IPA on a dial? Yes, but you probably shouldn't, and you should use it very sparingly, and if you think the dial paint might be a bit thin, just don't get the dial dirty. <laughs> Just That's the rule. Don't get the dial dirty. What happens if I get the dial dirty? Yeah, don't. And I highly recommend, even if you're disappointed with the build and do not want to continue, still following the rule of spraying a little bit of condensed air on your arm first so that you can tell if any liquid is coming out. Uh, anyway, we can spritz the inside of the case here and make sure there's no particles inside it, and then we can case it up and see what it's going to look like. One thing I can say for sure is don't let one mistake deter you enough to rush things and make more mistakes because it's just going to be more disappointing. Anyway, we've come this far, so we can press it down into the case and then insert the crown. And then we can lubricate the case back gasket. Pop it into the ring in the case there. And then pop the case back on top and screw it down. I will say that in spite of my tremendous failure, it definitely has been salvaged. In fact, with it inside the case, you can't really see too much of it. It doesn't look half bad. So then we can tighten the case back there and then flip it over to reveal the 55 Fathoms mod. I suppose it's done, isn't it? There it is. Good grief. So what is there to say about this one? It's just your run-of-the-mill 55 Fathoms SNZH mod with double dome sapphire crystal and, you know, the upgraded movement. I think my only critique on this, you know, of the parts is apart from the loom at the 12 o'clock being a bit rough around the edges at the top of the two, is that the brightness of the C1 loom is really poor. I mean, this is my first experience with C1 loom and up until now, I've only had parts with C3 and BGW9. And, and of course Seiko's Lumi Bright. I was hoping that the C1 loom would appear less green in natural light, which it certainly does, but I wasn't expecting it to dim quite so fast, nor be noticeably dimmer compared to the C3 that I'm used to. Is it a difference in brightness, color, or is the, f is the number simply how many layers of loom they've put on there, C1, C3, C5, you know, one layer, three layer, five layers? Do let me know because I am, I'm curious. At least with this build, I can say I salvaged it. After wrecking the dial and then getting the whole thing together and filming it all, I wanted to shoot some more B-roll, so I thought I'll set the time to 10 and 2, and then the minute hand stopped moving and the gears started grinding. I took the whole thing apart, right down to the bare movement, and I thought I'll just take the cog off of the date changing mechanism and put it on the 7S36, repair that, and put that in there and be done with it. And I had it all ready to go, and then when the hands didn't align, I pulled them off to try again, and then the gears started grinding, and I realized it's the post in the middle of the hand sit on. It can be pulled up out of position and it will start grinding. And all I needed to do was use the second hand pusher to press it down and remedy the problem. 
So I fixed the NH36, got it all back together, and here it is. And what have I learned from this whole experience? Well, the normal lesson would be that you're going to make mistakes, there's going to be blemishes, and you just have to roll with it. It doesn't have to be perfect. But what I've learned is sometimes there's a build where absolutely everything goes wrong, and all you can do is keep going. I think some failures are definitely there to show you that you should quit, you should move on to the next thing, you're done. Like, give up on it. It's not going to happen. And you're going to feel like doing that a lot. I'm pretty sure every time I build a watch, I tell myself, yep, that's it, I'm done, I can't do this anymore. But I think sometimes failure shows you that some lessons are meant to be learned more than once. You will make the same mistakes over and over and you'll keep learning how to fix them, how to avoid them. But here's the thing. That's just fine. Keep making mistakes, keep learning, because depending on how you look at it, the bitterness of past failures can make your future success so much sweeter. I'll see you in the next one.